What I'm going to talk about is um, my experiences, or some of my experiences, in an anecdotal way of working with children with special educational needs. Some of these are amusing, most of them are, most of them are not. But I need to give you a bit of background information this first time, otherwise you won't know where I'm at. Um, I work for 25 years teaching children with special educational needs, mostly one-to-one, -one, uh, mostly in primary schools. And I had all sorts of children. At one end of the spectrum, there were children who were working at what was called the first percentile, which means that 99% of children were achieving higher than they were. And at the other end, so there, there was not a lot to work with, really. They are very, very low IQs. And at the other end of the spectrum were very bright children who didn't appear to be doing too badly, really, but actually were massively underachieving and not reaching their potential because they were handicapped by something like dyslexia or dyspraxia. And in between, there were children uh, on the autistic spectrum, there were children with cerebral palsy, with partial hearing loss, with attention deficit disorder, which meant that they had the attention span of a goldfish, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which meant they had the attention span of a goldfish and were climbing the walls at the same time. Um, or the children with a, a combination of these things. And they almost all had... Um, associated behaviour problems. There are no naughty children in school now, they're challenging. <laughs> Many of them were challenging. Um, and most of them had uh, very low self-esteem and a lot of them had very poor home lives. So it was never dull. Um, you never knew what was going to happen really. And I could be working with them anywhere. This is all background, I'm sorry about this. Um, I could be in a staff room where people were coming in and out. I could be in a so-called empty classroom in which other groups of children were working. I could be in a corridor, which was horrific. Um, I could be uh, in the hall, which was all loud and echoey. Or I could be in um, a stock cupboard. Uh, that was usually favourite. But we were always told, if we were working somewhere like a stock cupboard, uh, to leave the door open. This was more for the people who were working in secondary schools uh, so that we weren't accused at some later date of doing something inappropriate with the child. Now, on this first story I'm going to tell you, I was working with a boy, <coughs> a big strapping lad, who had ADHD and was also a looked after child, so he had to be a bit careful. And we were working in, it was a large stock cover, but people would come in and out to use the guillotine and to get books and things. And he was very much monkey see, monkey do. And we turned over the page of his reading book and there was a picture of an ambulance. And it just fired something in his head. And he said, what's the worst thing you've ever seen, miss? So while I'm saying, well, I don't really know, he jumped up and dropped his trousers. <laughs> <laughs> and so I find I'm sitting there, sort of at eye level, with this strapping lad who's got his school t-shirt on top, but nothing on his bottom half <laughs> other than his underpants, mercifully. And I'm thinking, please don't let anybody walk in now. Uh, when I'm up in court in front of the magistrate, <laughs> well, the fact that I'm a grandmother held my case. And what he was actually showing me was a scar that went down the length of his leg. Uh, so I said, I thought, no, that is nasty. It was an old scar. Uh, and rather over brightly, I think, now pull your trousers up and sit down and tell me how you did it. And nobody did come in. Uh, but I wasn't certain that nobody would walk past and that I wasn't going to get accosted at playtime by somebody saying, what were you doing with that boy in the stock cupboard <laughs> with his trousers around his ankles? Um, so I, I told the class teacher and I also went into the loan support service and told the head of service, so I covered my back. A lot of the funny things that happened were because where the adults in the case thought the child was and where the child actually was was not one and the same place. And I had this, usually I provided the work for the children, but on this one occasion I was given a worksheet to do by the class teacher, and the boy was 10, and it was a sheet about wind farms, and I realised part of the way through it that he really wasn't understanding what he was reading at all. So I decided I'd need to tell him about wind power, so I said, wind power was one of the things we used before we had electricity, and brought him up short. No electricity, he said. What did they use then? Batteries. <laughs> which is why he wasn't understanding this worksheet on, on wind farms. And at another time I had a little girl who was 10 but she was working at reception level and we were about to read a book, a reception book, in which she needed to know, not to be able to read, know the words horse, cow, sheep and pig 
and she didn't. She was 10, but she didn't have them in her vocabulary <coughs> because nobody ever looked at the book with her and nobody had ever taken her anywhere where she would see a cow or a horse. So we're looking at this and she says, what does this say? And I read it to her and I said, that's the name of the lady who wrote the book. Well, she said, she did it very well. Look how neat it is. <laughs> I thought, is this the moment? Tell her about Gutenberg. <laughs> no, I think we'll stick with cow, horse, sheep and pig. And sometimes we would have geographical misunderstandings. Um, I was doing North, South, East and West in maths and I thought I'd bring it, make it relevant. So I said to this child, who was nine or two, uh, which part of England do we live in, the North or the South? And he said, uh, the South. So I said, no, we live in the North of England. Oh yes, he said, the South of England's near the North Pole. So we, got a, we were in the library, so we, we got a book of maps and we found the North Pole and we found where we were, so we sorted him out. And similarly, I had another 10 year old, he was going to the Isle of Wight on holiday, and I said, Oh, it would be lovely, You're, it's great, the Isle of Wight. You'll go on a boat. I think we go on a coach, he said. So I said, No, you, you'll, the coach will go on a boat. Why? He said. So I said, Because the Isle of Wight is an island. That's what it means, it's surrounded by the sea. Are you sure we went? So I said, yes, I'm absolutely certain. So we found a map and we found where Stockport was and we found where Southampton is. And we looked, I mean, his parents could do this, but obviously they don't. Um, and we looked to see how a coach might go from one to the other. And I said, you see this, here it's sea all round. And I said, this dotted line, that isn't actually in the sea, it's not really in the sea, but because that's otherwise he would have thought that. Um, that's the line roughly that the ferry will take to take you out to the island. And his face lit up and he said, oh, there might be icebergs. <laughs> so, and I was at university for four years in Southampton and in all that time it only snowed once and I didn't have the heart to tell him that it was highly unlikely that there would be icebergs bobbing about on the planet <coughs> or in the Solent, so I left him to it. The younger children, the younger children used to call me mummy or grandma or nana by mistake which was quite sweet and they would be very snuggly and they'd snuggle up. This was a mixed blessing because they were frequently very snotty and sometimes uh, they were scratching their heads and I was thinking like knit shampoo when you get home so. and um, on one occasion this little boy was snuggled up next to me for about three quarters of an hour when he said I'm all itchy miss and I knew better than to say show me until I'd asked where so I said where where are you itching here he said so I said lift up your t-shirt let me have a look so I lifted it up he was absolutely plastered in chicken pox which he must have had for at least two days because it takes a while to come out so I took him back to the classroom and I said to the teacher he's, he's covered in chicken pox we'd better look at his brother because he had a twin brother who had been snuggled up to me for the previous three quarters of an hour and we upped his t-shirt and he was also covered in chicken pox mm -hmm. but they'd both been sent into school plastered in it. Um, just before I was due to retire I had a six-year-old girl and she was all snuggled and she went all excited and whispering she said I'm going to give you flowers in assembly it's a surprise. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, right, I won't tell anyone then. No, she said, you mustn't, because it's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes I was surprised. Um, I was supposed to be raising their self-esteem. Sometimes it worked the other way around. And I had a little boy who was 10, and he was talking to me about his class teacher, and he said, she says she's a proper teacher, but she's not as proper as you are. <laughs> and I, I didn't pursue it to ask what he meant. Um, and penultimately, you'll be pleased to hear, the, um, the one that absolutely floored me was a little girl who was nine and she came at me completely from left field and I lost the plot. Um, she, was a, she was a lovely little girl. She had the most beautiful white blonde hair, big blue eyes, behind which not a lot was going on. Um, you would have thought and she was working at least four years behind where she should have been and we were talking about the whiteboard that I took into school with me because it's less threatening than writing on paper you write something and it's not right and you go like that and it's not there anymore 
and I said that I had it cut in half because it was too big to take into school and she said did you cut it and I said um, no my dad did there's a lot of thinking is your dad very old so I said well he's 80 more thinking is your mum very old <laughs> well she's 79 a lot more thinking 79 is that older than 80 because she can hear the nine and she can hear the eight but of course the nine is in the units and the eight is in the ten so we get the number square up and we look to see whether 79 is a bigger number than 80 and we decide it isn't and that was that and about three weeks later she revisited the subject of this cut whiteboard and in the interim my father had died and the children in this school knew my father had died because uh, I wasn't in school the day of his funeral and they had been told that when Mrs Tucker came back into school they got to be very nice to her because her father had died and she was sad. So she's talking about this cut whiteboard and then just completely out of the blue she said when someone dies and they've done something like that for you you have to keep it forever. And I, I filled up of course <laughs> and um, I thought we've got this all wrong here her IQ is down here and we're worried about her but her emotional intelligence and her empathy and fellow feeling are way higher than many adults that I've come across. Men in particular, well that's a risky thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, to cheer you up, um, I was doing words that had QU in and we had a list of words and one of them was quicken, which obviously he didn't understand. So I gave him the example. Sometimes you get examples of, of their home life. You can tell what's going on at home. And, um, I gave the example, the children quicken their steps when they see the ice cream van. Oh, I get it, he said. Shall we go down the pub for a quicken? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>